Welcome to the Future of Quantum Computing panel discussion. I'm Jennifer Ouellette. I'm a senior science editor for Gizmodo, uh, a website that covers a lot of, quanti a lot of uh, science and technology, and of course, quantum computing is of great interest to us. Um, I'm delighted to be here today as your moderator for what we hope will be a very free and open, um, informal discussion about the future of quantum computing with some of the leading people who are at the forefront of making this a reality. I'm going to do a quick interrupt, interruption, uh, in, introduction in alphabetical <laughs> order. Uh, over here, we have Ray Beausoleil. He's an HPE fellow at Hewlett Packard Laboratories. Next to him, we have Charles Bennett, an IBM fellow at IBM. And I don't think I need to tell people here that uh, at, you know, he was one of the pioneers of quantum entanglement and cryptography and those sorts of um, breakthroughs that happened uh, in the past. So we're delighted to have him here. Next to him, uh, we have Parsa Bonderson, who's a senior researcher at Microsoft's Station Q. If you've been uh, either at this morning session or at the event last night, you heard a little bit about some of the work that they're doing. Immediately to my left, I have James Clark, who is manager of quantum computing, interconnects, and RAM research at Intel. Um, next to him, Raymond Laflamme. Executive Director of the Institute for Quantum Computing uh, in Waterloo, uh, Ontario. And finally, last but not least, Hartmut Nevin, who is Director of Engineering at Google. So I think you can tell just from, from that introduction that we're going to have a really interesting discussion here today. How I want to start is to get sort of a bigger picture, you know, a, a big picture of where everybody fits into this very large field of quantum computing. There's a lot of different approaches, a lot of different uh, ways, different ways that the people on this uh, stage are investing and working uh, in this area. So I'm going to start um, with Ray Beausoleil. And I'm going to start, I'm going to ask you all the same question, why quantum computing and why now? And then I want, to get, want you to give um, us an idea of what your own organization is working on in this area and why you favor it uh, for, the, for quantum computing. Well. Uh, <laughs> it's a big opening question. Right, and I'll try to keep it brief because I'm sure that's uh, one of the things that we're shooting for. I am going to sound a little bit like the wallflower at the prom in this conversation because uh, we worked for six or seven years uh, on quantum computing and entanglement in NV diamond cent uh, color centers. And um, we got to a point where I realized that we did not know how to scale that platform. And I began to realize that uh, there were uh, four horsemen of the scaling apocalypse that we would have to understand before we could build a machine that even used 100 or 200 computational qubits. And those four horsemen are uh, integration, packaging, interconnect, and defect tolerance. And so we actually took a step back, and we are currently looking at trying to scale just coherence. So just taking a very large number of nonlinear optical devices on a die and get them to interact coherently and to see what computing paradigms uh, emerge as we understand how they behave as a system, how we do the layout, how we do the simulation. And it didn't take us long to figure out that we really didn't know what we were doing and that there was a lot of research opportunity there. But if we're successful in scaling coherence to thousands of nonlinear optical devices on a chip, and then we can move the operation of each of those devices down to the stochastic limit, then we think we might have a handle on how to move next uh, to quantum computation uh, to, to a platform where we, can ha we have an appreciation for what exponential scaling offers uh, as we move to post-Moore's law computing. And so if you're a big computer company, you're looking at quantum computing because you know that depending on your point of view, and I don't want to say this uh, with someone from Intel here, so I'll modify it a bit, but Moore's law is in danger of being over. Uh, <laughs> and so we have to start thinking uh, uh, more energetically uh, about what computing will look like in 10 to 20 years. I suspect you will have something to say, say in response. <laughs> um, Charlie, again, you know, uh, I, I'm particularly interested in IBM's interest in trying to build a quantum computer, particularly since it was where much of this was pioneered. Um, well, uh, I suppose this is not the place to say anything uh, uh, 
bad about uh, Richard <laughs> Feynman. <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, IBM, uh, I've got to say two bad things. Well, no, one, only one bad thing. <laughs> IBM, one good thing. IBM doesn't, uh, ha has never had anyone quite as bright as Richard Feynman. <laughs> and, uh, but we've been working on both the, the basic science of information processing, uh, and the, specifically the physics of information processing, for a very long time. Uh, and I mentioned the name Rolf Landauer and the Landauer's principle, which led to the discovery of the answer to the question, what is the thermodynamic cost of information processing? It was an unexpected answer. Uh, that that there is no comparability between mechanical, uh, between mathematical work and physical work. You could, in principle, you can get arbitrarily much computation done. So that's a very old story that I was involved with, Landauer was involved in. But he was also a very practical person who spent much of his life uh, bashing ideas that he thought were, were impractical, including for much of his life, a, until the last year or two, uh, quantum computing. So. What, what I want to say is the background for IBM's interest is that we have always been interested in both the basic science, which is not only physics, but things like the discovery uh, by Winograd that it's not much harder to multiply than to add. Now, most people probably think it's, if, if, if you're not a scientist or a mathematician, that it, it's uh, quadratically harder to multiply because you have to do all the, but in fact, it's, 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 it's almost the same. So that was important in the, in the mathematics of information processing. So uh, I guess I'm, well, let's try to focus my thoughts here. Uh, so this has continued. And so IBM is now, has for uh, the last, a couple of decades, been working both on the basic theory of what can be done with quantum effects. And I would say it's better to call it quantum information science than quantum computing, because even the word computing suggests a localized processor. And so much of our information technology world is not computing, it's doing things with delocalized information, uh, multi-user situation, this sort of thing that's, that's uh, treated in uh, the theory of distributed computation or uh, uh, the generalizations of communication theory where you have many senders and many receivers. And so th th it's, it's a broader field. So the question we look for, what qualitatively different things can, can the laws of quantum mechanics, which we now understand are the right arena within which to develop the theory of information processing, what qualitatively different things can we do with them in terms of basic laws of nature? And then, which of these things can we make practical and what do we have to do? And to make something practical is mostly not breakthroughs, it's mostly not things that you can write a newspaper article about easily, it's mostly incremental progress. So in terms of the practical work, or the experimental work, I should say, at IBM, it is focused on getting a small number of superconducting uh, qubits to work really coherently and to understand what they are doing. And that is a tremendous task, in putting a lot of effort into that. Right. Well, thanks. OK. Um, Parsa, Microsoft, from, from what I understand, is kind of taking a many-pronged approach, um, although we have been hearing a lot uh, at, this, at this conference about topological computing in particular. So again, you know, why now for quantum computing? It does seem to be you know, coming to fruition, that there seems to be just a lot more excitement and interest. There's a resurgence every now and then, and we seem to be in the middle of one of those. And also, you know, what is the essence of Microsoft's approach, and, and which of these technologies do you think is the most promising? Um, so I guess I would say why the answer to why now is because you know we're, we're starting to really feel like uh, this could be within reach you know at this time so you know that that obviously makes the time ripe um, and as far as Microsoft's interest um, well you've heard uh, this morning uh, from Krista that we, we have uh, the group she's leading in Redmond working on algorithms and uh, compiling and among other things uh, you know, what to do with a quantum computer once it's built, but we also have our group in Santa Barbara, which is focusing on, you know, how to actually implement a quantum computer, and our approach, the main approach that we're, 
we're kind of pushing is the topological approach, which you also heard uh, <laughs> uh, a nice introduction by Jason this morning on some of those ideas. And, um, but we also keep our eyes on, on all the other technology, uh, all the other approaches that have been uh, you know, around and being developed for uh, you know, a couple decades now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's important to keep your options open to some extent to make sure that when you see the right technology, you go for it. And um, personally, I think that even if we do manage to develop the topological uh, technology to the point where we want, it's quite likely that we're going to have to have some um, hybridization of the topological and conventional approaches. Right. So. Excellent. Thanks. Okay, Jim, um, you know, it's interesting to me, you know, Intel, obviously, Intel Inside, you know, you, you're a maker of chips and you're one of the leading manufacturers of that. So does Intel view its role um, as a player in building a, a working quantum computer or more as like a connector between various technologies? I know, for instance, you've done a lot of work on fast switching. Um, and I'm assuming you also might have a response to uh, Charlie's opening Which comments. Which me to respond to first? <laughs> um, why don't we start with your response to Charlie okay. and then we can get to the other question. Um, we're here to celebrate uh, Richard Feynman, who is arguably uh, Caltech's best professor. Um, let's, recognize, <laughs> um, uh, let's recognize perhaps Caltech's most famous graduate, I would argue, and Gordon Moore. Um, and it's really Gordon Moore's vision that I think will enable quantum computing at, at some point. Um, people have been saying that Moore's law was over since about the time Richard Feynman proposed the quantum computer in 1980, the truth is we only have visibility maybe to about 10 years in the future. Saying Moore's law is ending is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If, you're give, if you say it's ending, you're giving up. The comment that I would make is Moore's law ends when we run out of ideas, <laughs> and we have lots of ideas. Quantum computing, um, the success of quantum computing, the viability, will not be limited by the, by the laws of physics. It's going to be um, enabled by the, 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 the ideas of, of people uh, in this room. And so um, my take is Moore's Law is not ending. Uh, in fact, I think we need at least a couple more generations of Moore's Law just to be able to enable a large-scale quantum computer. Um, to, answer, to answer your second question of, uh, of what we're interested in, I think right now we're interested um, across the board, um, whether it's the control or ancillary um, electronics for a quantum computer or actually the qubit plane itself. Um, one of the reasons we got into quantum computing uh, at this time is we took a look at the maturity of the, um, I'll say the process uh, in the, uh, primarily in academia and asked whether we could contribute. If you take a look historically at transistors as an example, high K metal gate or FinFETs, um, the increase in performance as we moved from academic laboratory-based processing to uh, full wafer fab processing uh, dramatically uh, increased. And so our hope is, is that we can, um, by making use of our, our process expertise at a, at a place like uh, Intel or any other large um, semiconductor manufacturer, that we can see gains in performance at the, at the qubit level. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, Ray Laflamme, I mean, you've also been involved in a lot of, um, I guess you'd call it fundamental uh, research. Um, so tell us a little bit, again, you know, why quantum computing and, and why now, but also a little bit of, of the kinds of things that you're focusing on um, in Waterloo. So we are focusing on different things because of the opportunities that we see in quantum computing. And we look at this opportunity because of, I think, a series of success that we've seen in the field in the last 15 to 20 years. The first one is we've learned that by using quantum mechanics to manipulate information, we can do some things more efficiently or things that we would not be able to do with classical devices. So we know this, that suddenly manipulating information with quantum mechanics is something which is different, new, and an opportunity. Mm -hmm. The second one that we've learned is when people started to have these ideas of doing something with quantum mechanics, the first reaction was, but it's going to be incredibly hard, and quantum mechanics, we don't know how to control it very well. Well, we've learned, at least in theory, how to control quantum mechanics. And I should be a little bit more careful here because my friends in condensed matter <coughs> or optics will say we've been controlling quantum system for quite some time. Can, can you <coughs> fix your, your uh, can everybody hear him? No. no. no it's not there. Does that work? No. 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 Then I'm going to talk loud. loud. <laughs> So the second thing that we've learned is how to control quantum system in a scalable way. That is, as we increase the size of the quantum system, 
the amount of resources that we're using doesn't go up exponentially. So this, the possibility of doing something, possibility of implementing it, was kind of two success. And the, la the third one I'll add is we've been able to. Uh, oh, no, it's coming. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Suddenly there's this little echo that comes back. <laughs> the third one is that we've been able to show that these ideas of being in superposition of all these states is not crazy in the lab. We can do this with a few quantum bits, like roughly about a dozen of them. So the idea is there, and we can do it a little bit, and then suddenly there's the opportunity of scaling up. Right. Charlie mentioned that a bit difference between computing and information processing. And this is something at the institute where we are, that we are, although it's called the Institute for Quantum Computing, we think about computing in a broad sense. That this is opportunity of manipulating information in atoms and molecules, able to extract information from them, not only for purely computing, but a broad uh, variation of them on computing, communication, or sensors. Right. And this is what we're interested in. Excellent, thanks. Um, if we can get a technician to check his mic, that would be good, because we have a long conversation ahead. <laughs> um, so now we move on to last but not least. I'm going to reverse it on the way back. <laughs> um, Google obviously is an early investor in D-Wave and made headlines when it did that. And it has an, it, it's very clearly, there's a very good reason why it's interested in quantum computing. Um, so I guess my question to you is, has this investment paid off for Google? And if so, in what ways? Yeah. Of course, an expected uh, question, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you can also answer, you know, why now? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, regarding D-Wave, um, we feel that um, this was money very well invested, yeah. because D-Wave, as we now all understand and I think appreciate, is an early prototype, but it has quantum resources present. There's entanglement present. There's multi-qubit co-tunneling. And it has a number of variables you can control that is larger than in any other processor. So you can very nicely use it to hone your models of multi-qubit behavior and of uh, quantum annealing in particular. Because um, when, for example, you set up like a multi-qubit NIBA formula, how tunneling transitions happen, now you have data to compare against. So you have dots on a graph that you can try to fit. And that makes your models just so much better and so much more useful. And just this ability alone, I think, justifies the investment in D-Wave. So I want to make a point that uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end of this. But anyone who has questions during the discussion, we do want this to be very conversation-like. We would like interaction. So if you have questions while we're discussing things up here, raise your hand. And we will try to, to get to you at some point. Um, so the next question is just a, a quick one, and we're going to reverse it and uh, start with uh, Dr. Nevin here. Um, assuming that we achieve a small working quantum computer of about 100 qubits, what would be your first killer app, or the first thing you'd use it for? You know, would it be like you know, a quantum version of Minecraft or something even better? <laughs> Um, maybe answering this question, I can quickly inject sort of how does our overall roadmap look yes, like. Yes, absolutely. So at, at Google, our main goal is to get to a practical quantum computer as quickly as we can. So practical meaning it can do some computations that some folks would care for that they can't achieve with, with classical uh, computers. And to get there, we bet in terms of hardware on superconducting electronics. Um, there are many good reasons for choosing superconducting but uh, not the least of which is that there have been huge investments, of course, in semiconductor, which we can leverage. Mm -hmm. So once we made sort of this bet and say, let's focus on superconducting electronics, within there we go sort of two routes. We um, build an annealer 2.0, taking our lessons from D-Wave into this effort, but also um, build a circuit-based model. And maybe it's as a far out point is sort of the universal error corrected uh, quantum computer. But on the way there, we of course don't have enough qubits, and then we have to <laughs> ask ourselves exactly the question you just asked what do you do with a small quantum computer of, let's say, 100 or 1,000 uh, qubits? So I continue to believe that one of the best horses to do something interesting is quantum optimization and quantum sampling, so what an annealer would give you. But there are also quite interesting things uh, to be done with uh, shallow quantum circuits. And we are having very interesting um, discussions within our team and collaborators. Um, how many qubits would we need until we can establish quantum supremacy? So what is uh, the, the first point where we can do a computation that you couldn't have done classically? 
and we hope that's en route to the 100 qubit uh, number. Right. It's interesting that you brought up quantum supremacy because that actually is one of my questions, and I'm just going to jump ahead. <laughs> uh, we'll get back to the killer app question in a moment. Um, uh, John Preskill, uh, one of the organizers of today's event, uh, tells a joke about you know two men who encounter an angry bear, uh, with the joke being that you know you don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to be faster than the other guy. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I would open that question of quantum supremacy up to all the panelists. Um, is you know what do you define as quantum supremacy? Um, you know in in your own efforts. Um, so anyone can jump in as they think of an answer or see fit. So I'm going to start. If you're thinking only about a quantum computer, yeah, maybe you can worry about quantum su supremacy. But if you think about all the application of quantum information science, then there's so many of them. Then I would say the people who are running behind are the people who don't have enough imagination <laughs> and are able to look at other possibilities. Like we're at the beginning of using these rules of quantum mechanics to manipulate information. It's like being in 1950 and say, the only thing that we are interested in is having a mainframe. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> <clears throat> Do you want to build on that? Because you, you seem to be agreeing. I would echo what Ray said. That is, it's, of course, we hope eventually to get qu quantum supremacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, that's not a good thing to focus on in the short term uh, for, for the reasons that he, he said. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Anyone else have anything to add on the question of quantum supremacy? <laughs> maybe what may be helpful in, in our discussions at Google, we <coughs> discriminate between two types of um, quantum supremacy. One is quantum supremacy per se, la pour la, just some computation for which you can prove you couldn't have done it classically. I think um, that would be a milestone that um, the quantum information community would probably celebrate. But of course, that's within our community a little bit outside, let's say my, my boss would probably also congratulate <laughs> us, but that would last for a week or two, and then he would ask for useful quantum supremacy. So can you now do some computation <laughs> that somebody mind? cares for? And I think achieving the second one, that is a much harder goal. And there is the question, for example, is that achievable without or only very light quantum error correction? Right, okay. So getting back to the killer app question, um, we heard a, a talk from your Microsoft colleague where she talked a little bit about some of these. And I know that I've heard quantum scientists in the past say that really what a quantum computer is good for is studying quantum systems, <laughs> <laughs> which you know, is not as glib as it sounds, because studying quantum systems is actually a very important enabling kind of breakthrough. So we'll, we'll pick up with killer apps and work our way down and before we move on to the next question. I mean, what, what, you, what, what would you use of the first small working quantum computer for? So two, two direction. The first one, I'm in an academic uh, milieu compared to other people around here. So I would use it to train students and postdocs and young faculty of how to really think quantumly. So we're used of doing thinking about the quantum computer as something with some gates and we have a very classical way of thinking about how to control it. And with a small 100 qubit quantum computer, you won't be able to simulate it classically. So you'll have to build your intuition. So that's the first part of one stream. The second one, I would do small quantum simulation that you mentioned. And I'll give an example of one. You say, OK, we think about quantum system. We think about physicists in their offices thinking about some weird type of matter that we, we have never seen or will never see. I would like to simulate uh, behavior of the spins of phosphorus in bones. In Be what? In, in bones. In, oh. Because the, oh. how uh, uh, fragile bones are can be related to the amount of phosphorus that, that we have. And we cannot image it, image it because there's not enough of phosphorus today or the sensitivity that we have is not high enough. If we understand the dynamic of the spins in the bones, then it get, might help us to find ways to do this. So here's a place where suddenly a small quantum computer can help us to learn a, 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 about a problem which is really practical and health related. Right. Uh, <clears throat> my comment would be, uh, is this on? Uh, my comment would be you need to resonate with uh, the general public. And um, uh, just a couple of, uh, for, for an early uh, quantum computer, and just a couple topics that have actually come up today. Um, 
40% of all supercomputing power is spent on materials optimization and design. I think uh, Krista showed that perhaps last night. Um, and if you notice the, the, the modeling today um, of what molecules they can study, um, a few that were just out of reach uh, were ozone and CO2. Well, that's climate change, um, and so that resonates with certainly uh, a, lot of, a lot of people. If you go even further, you start getting into the protein space, and we have to realize that uh, protein has, um, uh, what do I want to say, maybe uh, 10, to the, mm, 10 to the 80 different states, and it uh, can fold to its native state in a couple of, uh, of seconds. Misfolded proteins are the genesis of so many diseases, cancer, um, multiple sclerosis and others. So being able to study something uh, just a little bit larger than the, than the uh, molecule that was discussed uh, today actually could have enormous benefits. And that's what will really resonate with people beyond the, the quantum uh, physics community. Excellent. Uh, we did hear a little bit about this this yeah, morning. So, so John, <coughs> I got to say, uh, it's, it's hard when you're stealing the answers that I'm going to give. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I was also going to say that, you know, we heard a lot of great ideas from Krista this morning and uh, also simulating physical uh, systems, you know, as a, as a physicist myself, I, that's kind of what I think would be the most interesting, and we heard uh, a number of uh, comments Was everybody those, here this morning, or? Along those lines. It's pretty much, okay. Because I was going to say, yeah, you could repeat what Krista said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that was a whole talk. But, uh, okay. you know, we heard some good answers. So let me actually maybe b add to it by uh, borrowing from an answer that Michael Friedman likes to give, which is, we could use a quantum computer to simulate a better, or to design a better quantum computer. Right. You know, so like, if you want to go from 100 qubits to 1,000 or 10,000, maybe we're going to need to do some serious, uh, serious hard work to get there, and that might be a good use for a quantum computer to do. Right. Charlie, thoughts? Yes. The, uh, one, of, one of the ideas from Krista this morning was uh, designing better catalysts. So I think that's a pretty uh, interesting and tractable problem. Uh, but I would like to caution against the idea that the qu quantum computer is going to be a, a magic bullet for uh, c computational chemistry or materials design. And th this comes from a, uh, w when we speak of simulating these small molecules, uh, in fact, the computational chemists who have had to use classical computers for many decades and overcome their lack of a quantum computer by mere smartness <laughs> of approximate algorithms have done pretty well. So we have pretty good models of things that are not uh, ab initio quantum calculations for things as compl more complicated even like uh, protein folding and water. Now in water, the lifetime of a hydrogen bond is around 10 to the minus 11 seconds. And it takes a protein a few, a few seconds to, to fold. So one can do a, 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 a reasonable simulation of a protein flopping around and folding in an aqueous environment. Now with computers, classical simulation. And uh, that would be wonderful. And you wouldn't want to show this movie too fast because it would just be a blur. <laughs> and so it would be like I would say, oh, I've, I got this protein folding classical program on my computer uh, and uh, you know, you go in, this is a movie and uh, uh, it, it, it lasts for, for a, it, it, it asks for, lasts for 10 to the 11 seconds, which is I guess a few thousand years. <laughs> anyway, so, so we, you tell this to somebody, you say, well, you know, the movie, it can't be, most of it must be boring. Tell me the good parts, I'll just go and watch them. And those are the ones that have to do with catalysis. So the, the thinking that, you, that the problems of computational chemistry are just a problem of doing the quantum mechanics instead of classically, it's probably mostly a problem of the same kind of needle in a haystack for which maybe we could get some kind of Grover speed up if we're really lucky, but maybe it's just hard work and smartness together with some quantum mechanics for the, like the critical c catalytic steps. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a long slog, and I would say quantum mechanics is, maybe we don't need to revive Moore's law because <laughs> it's still going, but it's not going to be the solution to the supposed problem of the demise of Moore's law. It's going to change things in a way that is more interesting and less, it's like saying, 
if we've got electric, uh, if, if, if we've got radio, how much better does that make uh, things than if we just had a, a telegraph or if we just had post office? Right. It makes it very different. Right. And Ray, do you have anything to add in terms of killer apps? So what would I do if I had a 100 qubit quantum computer? Exactly. I actually have lots of ideas <laughs> on what I could do with a 100 qubit quantum computer, but as an experimentalist over the course of my career, I've made so many mistakes that you could argue that giving me that kind of computer would be a waste of a valuable resource. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, the, actually, the very, very first thing I would, would do is put it online. Would you make mistakes if you had it or, or if you didn't yeah. have it? Uh, but I'd make them faster. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'd put it online as rapidly as possible uh, and let people who are not physicists start experimenting with it. So let me tell you a story that I think is true. Uh, if it isn't... Uh, don't tell me because I find this story very inspiring. And that's the first commercially interesting application of the transistor. Not the computer, not the radio, but the hearing aid. The what? what? The hearing aid. Oh, I really need one, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 honest to God, we did, we did not plan that in advance. Um, the, uh, the, the hearing aids of the 50s looked like a car battery with a torture device that you would wrap around your head. It had three very hot vacuum tubes, very large battery. And to go from uh, that apparatus to first the device that took the, uh, the vacuum tube out of the headband and replaced it with a packaged germanium-based transistor and then eventually to a much smaller power supply, the impact it had on people's lives was incredible. And so it was packaging that transistor and making a community of engineers aware that it was available that allowed uh, someone to come up with a terrific application that even at those volumes lowered the price enough that the guys at RCA could afford to tinker with them in the laboratory. And so in my view, um, don't trust me with a 100 qubit quantum computer, let's get it online and, and uh, get people who are not me uh, trying to figure out very clever ways to use it. So think of it as a resource like a telescope Excellent. that people compete for. We have a question up here at front. Yeah. In terms of the paradigm and the promises of com uh, quantum computing, uh, please comment on the following uh, issue. One is uh, from the discovery of the dark particle, uh, scientists are saying, we scientists see the reality between chaos and order. Okay. Number two, Professor Yao from the Calabi Yao Manifold says, <coughs> we do not, as of now, have the geometry for the complete model of reality, and we may never have one. Okay. Uh, three is, uh, last one. <laughs> uh, Anyone dare? <laughs> okay, Charlie. Okay, the first answering the first two questions, it's true. Th oh, the first. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. What does it have to do with the with the uh, with the Higgs boson and the ultimate theory of everything? Second, and the, that was, that's basically the first two questions. The third question is, what do we use a quantum for computer for in in social sciences? So the answer to the first two questions is that we understand the, we don't understand everything in physics. And the big questions have to do with quantum gravity and string theory and cosmology and so on. But we understand the stuff that the world is made out of, electrons, protons, neutrons, and so on, well enough that we can do a tremendous amount, and that is almost everything that concerns our technology, including quantum computing, quantum information processing. The question of what do we use it for in the social sciences, I would say, there may be computational algorithms that, 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 that are helped by a quantum computer, and there may be, more broadly, social situations such as distributed trust, let's say putting, putting private information or processing it in the cloud in a way that you, you don't have to trust anybody but yourself, which, which quantum information processing could help. Excellent. I'm yes. going to add one piece on the question number two, geometry of space-time. 
I think oh, the yeah, answer yeah. is in front of us <laughs> and this carpet. <laughs> and I think John has selected this as the, uh, the, the logo for this conference, which is really using quorum information and quantum error correction to kind of elucidate questions about the geometry of space time. So maybe it yeah. is there. It's all about entanglement. I, I wish I'd said that. I meant, I, I knew I was leaving something out. <laughs> <laughs> The approach is maybe slightly different. <laughs> in formulating fundamental laws of physics is incredibly difficult. It's actually only available as a profession for a, a very thin strata of humans, for example, those people who go to Caltech. So the question could be, is this really a task that as physics develops further remains a human task? Or is this not rather a task that she, we should hand over to machines? And so can... AI be the better physicist? And I believe the answer is yes, and I believe the answer has to do with um, achieving this, will leverage quantum computing. Because we had once at Google um, a presentation on creativity by Murray Gelman, mm -hmm. and his model of creativity was he showed a potential landscape and then he showed a very deep um, global minimum in there, difficult to find. So if you find this solution, you have done something creative. And that's exactly the kind of tasks that, for example, quantum optimization would be very well suited to do. So I would dare to say or conjecture that the most creative systems we will ever see will be um, quantum AI systems. And those will help us solving some of the um, issues you touched upon in your question. Right. Um, I actually want to touch on that because that is one of my questions. <laughs> um, the potential of quantum computing for AI and deep learning in particular. And, you know, maybe you want to expound a little bit on, on that. You know, how, how, will, how will quantum computing make our current AI and deep learning algorithms better or different or... Uh, yeah. so, since sort of like... That's machine learning and quantum machine learning is sort of the, the angle from which sort of we at Google entered uh, the field. Exactly. But now it's, it's a whole community with a lot of um, papers. But a lot of things that I see, uh, you can tell, it's, these are papers written by people who haven't done machine learning before as a main <laughs> profession. They are offering solutions to problems that machine learning people often don't have. Um, but there are very attractive things you can do using uh, quantum resources. For example, one of the, um, my favorite uh, algorithms is an algorithm uh, we developed that allows a learner to learn from very polluted, noisy data sets. As you know, today a, a major bottleneck in machine learning is, um, despite all the uh, fabulous advances in deep learning, the main work is to prepare very clean training data sets that you have to give these machines to learn from. That's time consuming, expensive, and often these clean data sets are not even available. So if, but using a quantum learning protocol, you can formulate it uh, such that the uh, learner can actually reach um, base accuracy, so the theoretically best classification accuracy by, um, from, by learning from training data sets that are maximally polluted. For example, for a binary um, task, there could be up to 50% of the training data could be mislabeled, and yet you could uh, retrieve um, base accuracy as a classifier. And to, to me, I often liken this, or this to me is a hallmark of intelligence. You know? like it's, it's to me like the, the smart kid in school which goes to the teacher and say, hey, teacher, teacher, what you just told me, I think is wrong. And in the same way, a quantum learner would be able to look at a data set and sort of take out those examples that are probably mislabeled or can't be interpreted. So there are nice advances you can achieve in machine learning by, um, if you were able to solve harder optimization problems than classically available. Excellent. Well, this reminds me that it could be helping to answer your question, a major social benefit because uh, one of the things you'd have to teach kids growing up or in, 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 in high school is not to believe everything you see on the internet, <laughs> which is an example of a polluted data source. Or even earlier, uh, Churchill 
once said that the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> so <laughs> if it could help people in this task of critical thinking, I, I would say I am less optimistic about uh, there being a straightforward quantum solution to getting a good critical thinking uh, capability. But anything that could help with that would do a tremendous amount of good. Any other panelists here to comment on AI and deep learning? <laughs> Excellent. Yes? I'll, I'll offer a cautionary note and, <laughs> and present an opportunity. I think one of the, if we're thinking of a quantum AI in the very narrow sense of solving specific machine learning problems that are related to one function of uh, an aspect of being human, then I think it you can begin to map that onto the sorts of things that we hope that a quantum computer can do. But I want to caution you that we do not have a very good abstraction of how the brain works. We really don't have a very good abstract, abstract model of how the mind arises from or emerges from the brain. And so asserting that we can build a quantum brain is a lot like saying that without understanding the four fundamental forces of flight and the three controls that we need, that we can build an airplane, and that perhaps the best way to build an airplane is to build the very best artificial feather that we can. And I don't, I don't think that uh, historically we know that the abstract model of flight allowed us to do things that birds can't do. And so the opportunity, perhaps, is to use a quantum computer to model a classical process and help us understand a bit better how it is that the brain works. And this may be something that uh, Hartman was alluding to earlier, where the problem of abstracting how our own brains work may be bigger than the brain can do. And so using some other tool to help us do that might guide us in understanding how to build AI systems in general. Because look at the way you live. You've got five senses, and you use them all at the same time to do a zillion different things. You do it with a few pounds of stuff that uh, burns uh, at maybe 70 or 80 watts. That's the whole body. I think that the brain is about 20. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I overestimated by a factor of two or three. Um, <laughs> so in any, in any case, uh, uh, the young people in the audience, uh, don't listen to us. Uh, build an abstract model of thought, and you have something. <laughs> yeah, easy money. We have a couple of questions um, right here, and then the person up there in back. I'm sorry, I can't see very well, so. That's you. <laughs> so, um, no. <laughs> so in, in December, we put out um, a paper that showed that for a contrived proof of concept problem, we could show that the, the D wave uh, quantum annealer solved um, or found it was an optimization problem where you had to find the, the um, best solutions as a global minimum. So for these contrived examples, the D-Wave annealer was able to do this about 10 to the 8 large number, um, 100 million times faster than, let's say, a classical version, simulated classical annealing would take on a single core. To a similar number um, also applied if you would have run Quentin Monte Carlo um, as a solver to find this uh, global minimum. So that was, I think, a very nice proof of principle that quantum annealing can outperform its classical counterparts. Unfortunately, um, there's still a big loophole in the sense that in the um, D-Wave chips, the qubits are only very sparsely connected. They're connected by what's called the chimera graph. So one qubit is connected to typically six other qubits. And this sparse connectivity allows other solvers that use information about this graph structure and they could have solved these problems faster than the D-Wave processor itself. So 
what would be needed in order to achieve um, at least the polynomial speed up uh, exponentially <laughs> we are not hoping for, you need to make the D-Wave chips more, or an annealer 2.0, you need to make it more expressive. If you could express very rugged or optimization problems with a very rugged energy landscape, then probably yes, um, we believe that finite range tunneling, which is the resource that we diagnosed as being present in the current annealer generation already, would probably be sufficient to achieve a speed up over uh, classical hardware. Yes, um, don't want to take too much time to um, <laughs> explain this. Essentially, what happens is because of the um, sparse connectivity, you can um, find within the D-Wave graph neighborhoods that are tree-structured. And problems that live on tree-structured graphs can be solved in linear time. So essentially, you can just spot sort of a large subset of the qubits and say, oh, for you, I know the solutions. And you pick another subset, oh, for you, I know the solution. And then you patch those solutions together, and then you very quickly get to the global correct answer. So it's very hard to formulate on the current uh, chimera graph structured problems anything that can compete against uh, such solution strategies. But if you were to make um, your qubits higher connected, and possibly, um, so, so a denser graph, and possibly bring in like what we call K-body interactions. So where not just two qubits talk to each other, but let's say three or um, quadruples of qubits feel each other directly in let's say three or four body interactions. If you could build an annealer this way, then probably you would be able to um, leave this competition behind. So perhaps, perhaps it's worth, worth making a succinct uh, clarification, which is just that the, while the D-Wave device has 1,000 or so uh, qubits, it's not a uh, general purpose quantum computer. Mm -hmm. and so I guess another thing would be like decoherence. Uh, we're going to be getting to that, actually. Yeah. So yeah, let me make, make an additional comment about, uh, about that, 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 that array that they have. Um, Hartmut already, already highlighted um, the, the connectivity. And I think that's what worries me most. I spent the last seven years thinking about interconnects at, at, at Intel. Uh, and that's the part that worries me most about quantum computing, is not whether we can make one qubit or two qubits, um, but that our paradigm for connectivity, which might scale to 100 or 1,000 qubits, absolutely won't scale to a million qubits, which might be the necessarily uh, qubit uh, levels that we would need for uh, something like Shor's algorithm. Um, so it's not only how you connect the qubits together, how you get information into and out of um, uh, the qubit plane. Um, I think that's a, that's a, a, b a big area of risk um, uh, that needs to be addressed in the field. And that actually, uh, you want to go ahead, Charlie? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was wanting to offer some, some optimism uh, <laughs> about the, the, what is, uh, we generally are very aware of how hard it is to preserve coherence and how much we would really need to do that to get a general purpose quantum computer. And the IBM approach, at least in our experimental efforts, has been to try to get a small number of qubits that we really understand and stay coherent for the duration of the computation. But I should remind from the, uh, uh, of the history of, of classical computing. Uh, when I was born, Nobody could have imagined that you could have a, a classical computer with uh, billions of, uh, of uh, transistors, and they didn't have transistors, uh, and that would go and do billions of operations without uh, any real uh, uh, error. So the idea that this, and at that time, even if, with the first transistors, people would not have understood that it was possible to make the technology so so scalable and so reliable. And, and the, the progress there has been mostly incremental. It's not been some discovery of new principle of nature. It's been just working hard and making it better and better. And I think a few more decades, it could be that the idea that a quantum, that a qubit is, is in, intrinsically so delicate that, you, that you're, it, it's almost hopeless to try to error correct it, that may be, uh, well, in fact, von Neumann de de developed a whole uh, philosophy for uh, 
error correcting classical computers that were likely to fail every uh, few dozen operations. And we don't need it. Oops. <laughs> so we don't use it. Uh, so it, it could be that someday that the quantum uh, computers will be like that. We just have a way of making them and we, and we don't have to worry about the error correction. Right. Anyone else want to weigh in? Because th this actually does tie into a couple of my questions and I think I'll just start with the scalability question. Um, because it's one thing to put two qubits together into a logic gate, it's quite another to put like a thousand or a million of them um, all together. Um, are there, for example, memory effects or other kind of quantum effects that maybe we don't know about yet because we haven't really tried to put these many things together? So, you know, thoughts from anyone on the panel about, you know, scalability and what some of the obstacles are and, you know, what some of the promising avenues might be to solve that problem, I think would be of interest. There's a, a fundamental scalability problem in any, so I mentioned uh, earlier uh, the four horsemen of the scaling apocalypse uh, <laughs> integration, which if you're going to build a thousand or a million of anything, then a technology like photolithography that uh, enables you to make, uh, even if you're targeting a thousand devices, you better prepare to make a million. Uh, because we'll get to the fourth horseman uh, in just a moment. But the uh, ability to uh, build many, many devices with very high yield is intrinsic to a, uh, a scalable technology. And the second, um, uh, as we heard just a moment ago, uh, is, inter is uh, interconnection. You know, the ability to uh, connect all of these um, uh, bits or uh, qubits in a, a way that enables a particularly general approach uh, to solving important problems. The third is packaging, and it's not obvious, uh, as a scientist, it's not obvious that that's a problem, but we've worked on photonic interconnects in my group for about a decade, and that's where we are. The ability to package something, to take the interface between your technology and the outside world that may be using it and abstract it away so that they just don't have to deal with the reality of what's under the hood. And it's amazing, but that can cost tens of millions of dollars even for things you already know how to build, like a switch. It's, uh, it's incredibly... Uh, uh, there's an old saying in the photonics industry that... Um, Integration allows you to scale, but packaging will determine whether or not you make any money. <laughs> and, uh, and then fourth is defect tolerance. No matter how hard you try, uh, your devices might be nominally the same, but will not be exactly the same. And so within a particular envelope of final as fabricated performance characteristics, um, you want your devices to be able to operate in a reliable way, or you want to be able to work around the ones that don't. And so you'll notice that I haven't said a darn thing here about quantum effects or coherence or anything else. That kind of scalability you need to have, not just in the quantum technology, but in the classical control plane that you're using to actually uh, implement any particular software algorithm that you're executing on the quantum computer. And so this, this scaling problem is what forced me to take a step back about two years ago and start treating scalability of uh, a nominally quantum resource like coherence as a first-class interesting research problem before uh, we get too big for our britches and try to scale entanglement. Let me, let me offer just a little bit of uh, optimism, though. I, sh I agree with all four of your um, uh, areas of concern. The optimism that I would offer is, um, if we take a look at the spin qubits in particular, they're about the size uh, and the same composition as a transistor. They look very similar. Um, our current uh, uh, chips on the market uh, can have upwards of five billion transistors on them. Um, so, and these, these yield, these make money. Um, uh, saying that it's just going to be trivial to transfer this uh, to the qubit regime is, um, is, is absolutely unfair, but there's hope in that uh, the more you can synergize or build on the existing infrastructure. Right. Okay. I agree completely. Uh, yeah, so I guess I would say that uh, you know, I, I agree with the, the sentiments expressed in that it, it is important to continue, uh, as Charlie say, making this incremental progress uh, in the systems that we know um, and we've had an incredible amount of uh, uh, advance in the last couple of decades, but I think by 
you know, most uh, metrics you can apply to the system are at least an order or two of magnitude away from where we really need to be uh, to actually get a quantum computer working. And so I think that's part of why Microsoft's approach to the problem is to try to invent a new technology and not to, you know, say the, the existing technologies are necessarily bad or won't get us there, but it seems like uh, we could really use some kind of breakthrough. And that's what the promise of the topological approach is. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it basically promises a, 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 hardware, a, a hardware that has a more robust and uh, protected system. Right. Um, I actually was going to uh, follow up and ask you a little bit more about the topological quantum computer concept, because essentially what you're doing is tying knots in a medium, in a field, per se, correct? Um, and uh, the, the advantage of that is that it's stable um, uh, against right. some of the noise from the outside. Right. Um, I, I'm, I don't know if you're aware, but in the last week, um, there was a, uh, uh, a group that actually managed to do rings, um, tie little mm -hmm. rings, more unknots, mathematically speaking, um, in a Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, what is envisioned for a topological computer, right, but right. do you find that kind of advance promising for your... Um, well, so I had a look at this article that uh, you're referring to and uh, you last night, and um, I, I'm not sure what, if anything, it, it actually has to do with the topological approach. You know, mm -hmm. they have their knots are solitons in, in, in three three dimensional space, and the knots that are you know the braiding and the knots in uh, topological quantum computing are in space time. Mm. So it's really a two dimensional it's like a square it's, dance. Exactly, it's like it's like dancing, you know, like uh, shuffling around these anions. Excellent. Did you have uh, anything to add to scalability or? We definitely have made progress in the last 10 years on the amounts of coherence in systems around. Like if I look 10 years ago, what was coming out of the experiment list, they would do a small algorithm or control a gate, and if they had 5 or 10 percent error, they would say hurrah, and they would publish this in Nature and Science. <laughs> Today, you look at uh, the equivalent, we have good methods to assess the noise called benchmarking. So we have at least started the road of being more rigorous of how we compare different technologies and how we can try to go and look at the assumptions behind scalability. And we get, people get error rates now 10 to minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, and minus 5, and their best system it's very 10 to the minus 5, not 10 to the minus 5 percent. <laughs> yes. Okay, one yeah. error per 100,000 gates on their one qubit system very well and isolated. So this is not to be compared directly with what is called the accuracy threshold, but I think it is progress. So I remember, I won't say how old I am, but <laughs> the first, when I started to do quantum computing, I remember people telling me it is impossible to control quantum system the way you want to do in quantum computing. Mm -hmm. I think that hung up has gone over, at least in theory. In practice, in the lab, we can see that we are implementing these ideas. And there's a lot of work still to be done, but I think we are in the path of having much, much better control. Excellent. A thread that, that, that came up a little earlier, somebody was talking about memory effects. Yeah. And so we have these uh, theorems of the threshold theorem and so on, and people, some people uh, have, as, as serious uh, uh, physicists and, and, and critics of it say, well, that's kind of assuming the errors are sort of independent and local and so on. Maybe much worse things are going on. Maybe the environment is, is remembering what you did and is getting ready to ambush you at the next time you to correct one of these errors. Well, that's one of the main advantages of trying to build a small quantum computer, because in the classical realm, the same objection exists. And yet we know from experience that if you build something that's good at correcting independent errors, or the kind of correlated errors that you know about in, 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 a, in a pretty obvious way, such as if you run your, your, uh, your, your uh, uh, fingernail across a, a CD and you spoil a lot of localized bits, There's a, there are error correcting codes that deal with that. Uh, in, in, in general, it's found out that if you, if you deal with the fairly simple-minded error model, it works better than you thought it would. But to find that out, you, you, you can't prove it as a theorem. You have to build a thing and try it. 
So we're at the one hour mark, uh, which means it's time to officially start the Q&A. I have other questions here, including one from Twitter. Um, but first, I know that there was someone back there that had a question, you know, and I missed you. So um, I will try to remember to also repeat the question for our video. Yes, the gentleman right there. So I guess the question is, just how big a quantum computer would you need to simulate, say, the connectome of the brain? That's better. Yeah. <laughs> You'd need a pretty enormous classical computer to do that. Yeah. <laughs> what about doing it with a quantum computer? Right. Well, I didn't quite catch that. No, I was just spouting okay. out. It's uh, 10 to the 11 neurons. Uh, every neuron in the cortex is about, has about 8,000 synapses. So that's, uh, a large number just in terms of classical bits that you would need. And so uh, that's out of our side. <laughs> also, I, I want to still maybe add to sort of our view on scalability, um, because it might relate to this, is to scale up by a factor of, of 10 and then see what you have and then look around to take the next um, step of 10. And, and because the person who on, on our side is sort of in charge of scaling is uh, John Martinez, who many of you will know, um, is um, leading the Google hardware effort. And we have you know, these nice brand new labs in Santa Barbara that are ready for the next step in scale. And you know, that you could go to 100, possibly to 1,000 qubits. And then we will play with those, try to program something interesting for them to do and see what we can achieve with this. But that's, of course, a very far cry from thinking about something of the level of the connectome. I think that's <laughs> just too far out to get any consideration at this point. Right. Anyone else want to weigh in? There's another one back there. There's another one back there. There's a couple back there. All right, so, and there's one over there. All right, <laughs> thank you. Hold your questions. Keep holding them up every time a question ends, and I'll get to you. This gentleman right there, and then after him, the person in the blue shirt way back there. Um, can you repeat that question again? I didn't quite catch it. Yeah, you want to answer that? No. No, okay. <laughs> I would say that, that, that the, uh, the idea that has been actually uh, fostered by some of the founders of quantum mechanics, like, like, uh, well, like Bohr and, and, and Feynman, that quantum mechanics is full of problems, nobody understands it. They actually didn't think that. They understood it. What they didn't have was a, a way of explaining it, or they had explanations that were in words that sounded inconsistent. But in fact, quantum mechanics is very well understood, has been for 50 years, and what is hard to do is to explain it to the public. That is a big job that we should all be engaged in because if the public knows a little, understands a little bit better that it's something that is well understood and, but intuitively hard to grasp and we, and we need to cu cultivate our intuition. But in, in terms of, does somebody do an experiment that showed, that changed people's minds about how quantum mechanics works? That doesn't happen, even though you read in the newspapers that it happened. For example, you read that an experiment was done recently that showed that there's action at a distance. I hate that word, action at a distance. It, it, it doesn't happen. Do you understand entanglement? You under, and Einstein understood that there was no way to use quantum mechanics to send a message faster than the speed of light. And yet, lots of people in the outside world think that. So, in answer to your question, uh, it has not changed our understanding of quantum mechanics. What about quantum information? 
question is, what about quantum information? Quantum information, if what that has done is to say this field, which we thought of as being just physics and chemistry, turns out to be the right way to formalize the notions of, of information and information processing and communication. In other words, to take the theory of Shannon and Turing and do it right, you have to do it on a quantum foundation. In fact, the quantum theory is a theory of interaction and influence, not a theory of physics. And so that was a, a tremendous advance, which was sort of belated. It only ca caught fire in the, like about the 1970s. So that is a big advance, and that's led to the applications of quantum information ideas, like no cloning, to such diverse areas as cosmology. Keep in mind that when we do, say, quantum chemistry, it still has the word quantum in it, um, <laughs> a lot of our work is, a, is a, a, an approximation, um, how we set up our ab initio calculations. And with a quantum computer, you can get a, either a much better accuracy. You could do the full configuration interaction of some of these molecules and get uh, you know, really accurate. That's going to change the way we think about some systems. Um, so maybe we aren't changing our fundamental, pr uh, fundamental principles based on quantum computing, but our understanding uh, of, uh, of molecular interactions, uh, I think, would be much more accurate with a, with a quantum computer. I think to pick up on Charles' comments, I would say maybe it has changed quantum information science has changed the foundations of information, but yes. not the foundations of quantum mechanics. Exactly. That's a, I, you, you must be good at tweeting, because I think that <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said half a page, and I just said what you just said. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to weigh in before we move on to the next question? All right. Um, there was the, the right back there, yes. Okay, so I guess the way to sum up the question is whether you could use a small quantum computer to um, test some axioms of quantum logic. Um, there was mention of uh, Bertram Russell's Principia uh, effort. Um, anyone want, want to? Oh, uh, no. you want to do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're good, you're good uh, at these kind uh, of questions. Uh, uh, Go for it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I can't promise to, to, to know the answer to that question. Uh, there was a lot of thought that perhaps a quantum computer could, could go beyond the, the, the uh, uh, things that could be proved by a classical computer, or that it could solve uns uh, uh, compute uncomputable functions and things like that. that that's not so, that you can, you can simulate anything that a quantum computer could do uh, by merely exponentially much more work of a classical computer. And in the realm of of uh, logic and, and, and uh, proof theory, exponentially more is, is uh, like uh, who, you, you, negligibly more. <laughs> uh, they think about really, really fast growing functions there. So I'm not sure if there is a, a quantum analog of trying to make a theorem prover and make it work more efficiently. Uh, that's the and I think that's part of the question you were asking, and that's the part I don't know how to understand. But that there, there should be a great gap, uh, say, that, that quantum computers can compute uncomputable things. Uh, I think that that's pretty well settled that they can't. Anyone else? Okay. I want to go over here and, get, and hit some people. Um, there's a person right there, and then right behind her after that. None of them are here. <laughs> <laughs> so as, as the Manhattan Project drove advances in understanding atomic vision and had many offspring uh, children that were beneficial more than an atomic bomb, what are the conditions that you guys see 
would drive us from a market competitive model um, looking for market supremacy in developing quantum computing to a public oriented cooperative model that would drive us toward the, the Manhattan Project for computational computing. What are the social conditions, the political conditions that would cause us to move toward that crisis urgency? All right, just to, to restate uh, for because uh, we're taping this, um, you're asking what what you know what some of the social political co you know things m that might happen to essentially have a shift from this more what you perceive to be a competitive driven market approach to quantum computing to something more like a Manhattan Project for quantum computing, um, which was a sort of public effort that uh, generated all these offshoot uh, breakthroughs and technologies apart from the atomic bomb. Correct. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> a real clear, clear, clear example would be uh, cryptography. I mean, if you take a look at where the funding is coming from at the academic uh, level, it does come from governments around the world. And what they're interested in is basically using cryptography, um, not to get everybody's credit card information, but to, <laughs> to decrypt um, uh, messages from terrorist networks. It, it becomes basically a public protection. Uh, and that would be the, uh, at least the high-level goal. Now, Shor's algorithm is one of the harder algorithms uh, from, a, from a qubit demand perspective, but that would be the goal, is basically um, safety and peace. Mm -hmm. Hammett? Um, yeah, I want to make the remark that I don't perceive our field as that uh, competitive or, or market-driven. Um, at least at, at Google, we have the, also opinion that a practical quantum computer can be built, little doubt in this. There are many major obstacles we have to work on and, and solve it. And um, we are still relatively far from product, so um, uh, it's a good time where sort of you can invite the best minds to get together to solve these problems. And we try to be very open with our results. Everything gets published and people um, get to see it. And we also try our best to nurture um, cooperation. And I actually take delight in seeing that there are a number of papers where you would see co-authors uh, from Google or from Microsoft. Uh, you may see some um, the Google Intel or NASA. So there are various uh, configurations, um, and not just between companies, of course. Um, co-author lists, um, of course, clearly um, include lists of uh, academics as well. So I, I don't. It's not really a concerted Manhattan-type project um, field, but I think it's a good community that collaborates. See, it could be, I, though. <laughs> the, I, I, um, when I referee papers on quantum computing systems, I always, I still see Shor's algorithm in the first column of the PRL. And <laughs> I think that we've made a category error as a community. Uh, if you look at LIGO, which is a few hundred million, maybe approach, uh, a, few, a few hundred million, maybe approaching half a billion dollars, or um, the, super, uh, the uh, uh, LHC, these are order billion dollar scientific experiments. And if you'd like, you can argue with me uh, that, in fact, they're going to have lots of applications. We'll be able to use the Higgs boson in some way in my uh, Palm top, uh, but uh, more to the point, I think uh, the I, I've been telling funding agencies uh, very much the same thing that John Preskill mentioned last night. If the, one of the most important things you could do with 1,000 entangled qubits is use it as a probe of new physics, tell you things about the universe you didn't know before. And so, to go to the government and say, "Look, we want you to spend a billion dollars on a computer." isn't to me as important as saying you've spent order half a billion dollars to detect gravitational waves, which would be a remarkable scientific advance. We don't even know if we can detect them. Uh, we want to look for the Higgs boson. Let's spend $10 billion to do that. Go to the government and say, with a billion dollars, we can probe fundamental ideas about the way the universe is built. And by the way, there are some spin-offs in, in computing and stuff like that. Uh, so it, it's possible, I think, to think much more broadly uh, and uh, in a way that could have a much larger impact by freeing entanglement from the burden of being a, the best computer we've ever made. Okay. Uh, Charlie and then Parsa. So.
<laughs> Go ahead. Continuing on, on that, the, 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 these large scale uh, projects where people put uh, public money to, to solve some public problem, you'd have to, you'd have to make a, a problem that a lot of people cared about. But the competitive model, which is whether it's competitiveness among, uh, among industries or competitiveness in the, in the academic setting, uh, one of the things that was highlighted yesterday and today is that this is an exciting area of, of not only basic physics, but the understanding of information. And so to have, uh, and, I, and I think uh, John Preskill would agree with me, the whole uh, focus of this, this conference and that yesterday's one uh, on finding something that young, smart people really care about working on, that's a kind of competitiveness that you don't need it to have an application to, to human welfare to get. You know, you're getting smart uh, students coming here, be, and, and I'm seeing people, and there was a guy who came, to, uh, applied from some other marketing branch of IBM, said, uh, he wanted to join our quantum information group so he could do breakthrough research. And so I said, well, gee, deciding that you're going to do breakthrough research is like making a firm decision that you want to be spontaneous. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of discouraged him. But I mean, in an academic atmosphere, and I think this is exactly what, what this uh, uh, One Entangled Evening was trying to do, is to show the world that this is an exciting, exciting field that every educated person should know about a lot more than they do. Parsa? Yeah, so I guess I was also going to say that, uh, you know, maybe having this panel stacked with a bunch of people from corporations just gave the false impression that, you know, only corporations are in this and we're all competing. You know, we, we actually, yeah. you know, we really do have this kind of uh, cooperative uh, situation now. You know, we all work with academics. Uh, we we have very close ties. You know, Microsoft, you know it as a big software company, but a large division of it, Microsoft Research, is just doing basic research. Mm -hmm. You know, we do basic science. So right. I would say we're already there. Yeah, that actually does, that is one of my questions, and I'm going to throw that out before we take a couple more questions, which um, the role of academia in all of this. Um, I definitely know that Microsoft partners um, with, for, for instance, Charlie Marcus in Copenhagen. That's not the only partnership that you have with academia, and I'm sure all of these other uh, gentlemen have partnerships as well. So let's talk a little bit about what you see as the role of academia uh, in quantum computing, particularly in, the ter in basic research over the next 10 to 20 years. How do you see yourselves working together? So we have a big uh, a partnership with uh, QTech, which is um, uh, TU Delft and TNO uh, in the Netherlands. Um, <clears throat> we value them as, the, as the, um, uh, the quantum experts, while we would bring the semiconductor processing expertise to that, uh, to that partnership. Uh, historically, from a device fabrication perspective, the ideas uh, come from academia first, um, the, the novel devices, and turning that into the reality uh, typically takes place with the, the process control uh, of a large fab. Uh, so at least from a, a qubit perspective, um, we'll continue to rely on the, the university space to provide those ideas. Yeah, so we, uh, you know, we have, as you mentioned, Charlie Marcus at uh, Copenhagen as a partner, also uh, Leo Kuhnhaven from uh, Delft, also at QTech, uh, you know, David Riley in University of Sydney. We have lots of uh, academic partners who you know, they're the experimentalists. We'd be nowhere without them. You know, <laughs> you know, they're the ones developing the, the science and the technology. And, you know, it's absolutely crucial. We also have ties to uh, people here in Caltech and ETH Zurich and... And Santa uh, Barbara, I believe. So. Santa Bar well, <laughs> we're in Santa Barbara. Um, so all over the place. And it's absolutely crucial. I think we, we all have to work together because, you know, academics have fantastic ideas. You know, they have fantastic <laughs> capabilities. And... And, you know, to some extent, these are scarce resources. You know, we, we got to take it where it is. Right. Other comments from panelists? I'll, uh, I'll make a pointed advertisement uh, to the professors. Uh, we want your students. <laughs> <laughs> um, the so best and brightest. <laughs> you, you are now training uh, the next generation of scientists and engineers who are going to 
at the core of everything they do know how to apply uh, quantum mechanics. And so I believe that in 20 years, uh, virtually every information technology, whether it be entangled or coherent or what, uh, will actually require an understanding of quantum mechanics to move forward. And that means that the men and women who are making investment decisions at the, the uh, senior technical leadership level in large and small companies will have to know quantum mechanics in order to make the best investment decisions possible. And so I think it's crucial to engage academia uh, when I think it's fair to say, at least in my company, that senior management doesn't know a lot of quantum mechanics. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. It, I was just as shocked as you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, it's, it's incredibly important to engage academia, work with academia on the hardest possible problems, show uh, students that a career in industry is, is not just viable but exciting because you can have a huge impact on, on the world, on the human race. And so the, uh, the importance of bringing that next generation of decision makers into industry so that in 20 or 25 years, uh, quantum mechanics is part and parcel of everything that we do is one of the most important, uh, one I view as one of the most important parts of my job. Anyone so, else? Right, I'm happy you're saying this <clears throat> because when IQC started 13 years ago, I had somebody from industry who told me, yeah, it takes 10 to 15 years before s students that graduate end up in position in industry where they have responsibility and make decisions. So we're getting there, <laughs> the, the, the 13 to 15 years. years. So I hope that the management of uh, HP is going to get enlightened as the years come. <laughs> uh, HPE, please. HPE. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I have a quick question from Twitter for uh, the Google uh, crowd. Does Google have an alternative to the MS Liquid software, and when will they open source it? This seems very specific and not very much about quantum computing. Maybe so you don't yeah, want to I don't want to steal <laughs> some of the thunder of um, my academic colleagues. There will be a very nice open source effort for um, a set of libraries to um, simulate, emulate quantum system, control quantum system, compile to gate sets. So there will be an open source effort that uh, Google will support, but I feel it's not um, <laughs> to me to announce it, so I will refrain from it. Excellent. We have time for one or two more questions. I want to try and get someone from a different part of the room. How about right over here? Yes, right there. Is the brain a super quantum computer? Apparently, there is a new paper on the archive Mine isn't. on this. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone dare? <laughs> Come on, Charlie. Uh, this this idea is has been around even before any much uh, experimental evidence. Uh, it, for example, in 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 uh, Pen Penrose's books, but uh, to show a, a quantum phenomenon occurring in the brain is easy. To show that it is important for the brain doing what it does in information processing is, is much harder. And my, my gut feeling is that my brain is, I agree with him, is, is a classical device. <laughs> Hanging on by it. Hemet, so, yeah, okay. and then yeah, we'll get to you, to Jim. So yeah, I happen to have some background in, in neurobiology. I actually spent yeah. years of my career in, in vet labs where people um, analyzed or took data from, from animals. Um, and I have given this a lot of thought whether there are quantum resources being uh, used in the brain. Um, I very much liked your answer. Um, I think the answer will turn out to be yes, that, that quantum resources um, may be used to some degree in a functional manner. 
I think the specific, uh, specific paper you mentioned with the phosphorus atoms is putting the requirements for how quantum resources can factor in, um, it puts them too high. I think there are other quantum algorithms like the variational quantum eigensolver that shows us how with a very shallow quantum circuit that probably or possibly could be implemented by the brain on a subcellular level so that you don't need long range entanglement across the nervous system, that such um, approaches could offer something that's viable in a biological system and it gives us new ideas how um, quantum resources may be used in the nervous system. But of course at this point the question is open and I know it can be quite frustrating. Actually two years ago we had um, a paper out that um, made a proposal how um, vibration assisted tunneling is at the core of neuroreception and it was a well formulated proposal how this could work and by now a neuropharmacologist has done this experiment and the answer was negative. This, as far as we can tell for now this process is not being used in neuroreception. So. Jim? So, no, I, oh, and then I, Jim and then you. So I, I guess I would say, you know, as we all know, all systems are quantum mechanical, and the question is whether or not the brain is a coherent uh, <laughs> quantum computer, and uh, I think that for that we just have to wait for any kind of experimental evidence. Um, in the meantime, maybe just uh, ask yourself if you can factor large numbers into their brains. <laughs> <laughs> Jim? No, I, I think I would just add uh, some of the topics that we've, we've heard of, uh, things like machine learning. Uh, um, you know, I would couple something like machine learning with something like pattern recognition, with class which classical computers have a really hard time with pattern rec recognition. And so if you were to get into the either the quantum space, neuromorphic space, which it touches on uh, Hartmut's background a bit, um, those would be things that are brain-like uh, that, that, uh, that could be quite powerful. I think we are out of time unless... Our two remaining panelists have anything to add? No? Well, join me in thanking our panelists for, I thought, a fascinating discussion.